A smile played over Captain Locke's face. They had escaped another danger and sailed through the small strait at sea. His attention turned to the stone walls to either side. The waves sent them dangerously close to running into them. He didn't need to think about what would happen to run into them. Oh, he didn't want his sapphire swan to be turned into wreckage. The captain barked his orders and his men rushed into action. His words echoed in the narrow pass. Captain Locke didn't know why, but the sound of his own voice put him on edge. Worst of all right now, something was watching them. He knew it, but he couldn't see from where. Carrying behind a boulder was a monster. She was once a beautiful woman, but no longer. Her torso was fine, but lo was a different story. She had a dozen tentacles which she walked on, with six of them ending in vicious mouths sprouting a triple set of teeth while three dog heads barked as they sprouted from her stomach. They let out a low growl as they eyed the sailors below. Oh, her stomach yearned to feast. It had been so long since someone had come her way. She crept closer along the narrow stone perch. Her mouth was watered at the thought of the taste of the fresh meat. Oh, she'd brine it in the salt to preserve it for later. She had no clue when her next meal would come. The captain looked about. His eyes darted to her hiding spot, but she pushed herself into a tiny crevice. It was tight, but she knew she could. She had been trapped here for years and years, ever since that damned witch. Captain Locke's head spun to a sound. It was like a pack of wolves. He had every dark corner above him, so high up, but he couldn't find anything. His fingers were twitching. He wanted to throw some fire and scare whatever it was out there. That would be a waste. He knew that. Chances are he hits nothing and achieved nothing but scare his crew. They were already tense as they navigated the dangerous waters. He threw a glance over his shoulders towards Charybdis. She was still, not swallowing the sea or belching it back up. For the time, she wasn't influencing their course. Good. Something darted down to the deck. One of his men screamed as he was lifted into the air as a serpent-like creature lifted the man in and dragged him back to the rocky cliffs. Every eye turned towards the surface. Their mouths fell open. A monster stood there. Her other tentacles were already in motion. Welcome back to Mythical Phylogeny. I'm your guide, Jason. Today we face the second of the infamous duo of monsters, Scylla. Let's take a look at her strange biology and see what we can learn. Like many monsters in Greek mythology, Scylla was not born a monster. There are a few variations to her origins. She was once a beautiful nymph. There are some who admired her, but she rejected their advances. Eventually, the witch Circe became envious of the woman and cursed her. Scylla kept her face in torso. The rest of her fear was distorted. There are multiple accounts of her appearance. First off, she has a set of three dog heads affixed to her groin. They bark and snarl. Her legs are gone but replaced with twelve tentacles. There are claims that some of these tentacles have heads on them, which have sets of three rows of teeth in their mouth. Supposedly, when Odysseus sailed past her, she was able to snatch up and devour six of his men with said tentacles. She ends up isolated on the Strait of Messina across from Charybdis. Those who try to avoid one will be caught by the other. Though there are ways to pass Scylla. The first is to ask Scylla's mother for protection. It would seem that Scylla hasn't fully lost her mind. There is some semblance of it there. Okay, our poor, coursed woman has quite a few hungry mouths. There is a question of whether they are functioning heads. Do they have brains? Do they have stomachs? Let's hit the last one first. I think that Scylla only has one stomach in her human body. For the dog heads at her waist, there isn't room for a stomach. If they eat, where does the food go? If they had an esophagus, it would need to push the food up to join the stomach. If it doesn't, it j just goes straight into the digestive system. Well, then anything eaten by the dog heads would join in the intestines. This results in a very limited food absorption. With the stomach section in the digestion to break down the food, the intestines would barely be able to do their job. That means the dog heads would be worthless to eat. What about the tentacles? The Strait of Messina is just under two miles wide at the narrowest point. That means that would be the most likely point to attack. 
we can use this to figure out how long the tentacles could be. Last week, we established that Crotus would be around 500 feet wide in her mouth. Due to her size and depth, we could bet that Crotus takes up the largest portion of the strait and leaves Scylla with only a narrow stripped hunt. Looking at these water flow maps, we can see the approximate area in which Crotus swallows the ocean. The Strait of Messina is a little under two miles wide. As you can see, Scylla only has about a fifth of a mile to hunt, or about a thousand feet on the shore of Calabria in the mainland Italy. That would be the place that would give her the largest hunting ground. Now there are two options here. First, and I don't like it, is that she can swim into the waters to attack. Why don't I like this? Well, she runs the risk of being eaten by Charybdis. Unless she can anchor herself with the tentacles into the water and not be swept away. This means we can have a reach of about 500 feet long tentacles. Two of them will span a thousand feet. This means that she will perch on the shore and reach out and would be safer. This would give us a longer option of the tentacles of roughly a thousand feet. Though I doubt they are that long. With the tentacles, she can prey on fish and other sea creatures easily. Now, the exact length is important. If each tentacle is that long, there's plenty of room for it to have its own stomach and intestines. In addition, even if it is 100 feet, your problem is pumping blood that far in addition to getting oxygen to the tissues. This is why I think that the tentacles do have heads. They need a mouth, lungs, a heart, and nerves to function. Due to the length of the body, Having its own separate system from the main body would be critical. Without a second heart and lungs, the tentacles would die of low oxygen, blood flow, biological waste buildup, and new nutrients not being able to reach the tentacles from Celia's human torture. I would go with a snake biology for the tentacles with a couple of changes. You could keep the vertebral column for support when reaching out, but I think making them collapse, which means they can stretch out of her tentacles when ready to hunt. The one I hit on early was the brains. Supposedly, Scylla has a human brain, three brains in her dark heads at her waist, and up to six heads on her tentacles. In total, ten heads. Now with ten brains, that is going to be a headache. If they aren't linked, there is going to be a constant argument going on. No consensus. Now this is important. I mentioned that Odysseus asked Scylla's mother for protection. He sailed the straits safely, but when distracted by the Charybdis, Scylla ate six of Odysseus' men. So that means that even if she follows her mother's wish, Scylla will attack people. That means a couple of things. One, the human had had some control of the rest of the body, but not full control, particularly over the tentacles. I believe that the human body has a more developed brain like that of a human, but the tentacles only have a simple primitive brain. In theory, if Scylla is thinking about it, she can't control it. But with Odysseus, she was too enraptured in the ship by Critters that she forgot about with them. Tell me, where is your hand right now? Is it in your lap? On a computer mouse? Where is it? Yeah, the same thing with Scylla's tentacles. I need to ask a question. Scylla can walk. She's mentioned having 12 feet or tentacles to move on. So, she can move about. Why is she where she is? Why stay near Charybdis? I think it is a choice. Both were nymphs that were cursed. Could there be some camaraderie between them? Or is she trying to protect others from herself? We know where she is. She's on Calabria in mainland Italy. She can go anywhere. She could go to the far north, east, or west if she wanted to. Would this place be somewhere people avoid? Or could it have meaning to her? That I can't find. Now, odd question. How would she swim? Well, I think means she would swim more like an octopus. It would require coordinated movements, reinforcing the idea of having control over her tentacles. So, your path takes us towards Scylla. First thing to win is not to fight. Go around her. You don't have to face her. Next, what sort of ship? She is fast when she attacks. She launches her tentacles and pulls them back. No bashing, smashing, or battle. Get in and get out for her. So rather than use a sailboat, go for a rowboat. Particularly if you can house your rows inside the boat. Well, then Scylla can't do anything to you. But if you stay above and manage your sails, what to do? 
I'd start with arrows and spells to deter her. Try to finish the fight before she can get to you. When she sends out her tentacles to grab you, bring a shield and focus on defense. Personally, I would choose a tower shield in a proper shield wall formation to prevent her from nabbing you. Use spears to poke out of your defensive line. Swords can work, but don't give you the range. I wouldn't try barrels as armor since she can wrap around and pick them up. If she tries that on a shield, you can drop it, go down, and escape. As for magic, I would start with fire. She'll be careful of reaching through a wall of fire floating on the water. Ice is another option. You can create a solid wall that she can't smash through. That will keep you safe. A dense fog could work. She can't see you, but you won't be able to see where you are going. Probably not the best bet. Yet there is one part of Scylla's myth I haven't touched on. In some versions of her story, the curse is eventually broken using enchanted flames. If you have a cleric brave enough to venture to her side, you could free her from this dire strait and permanently cleanse this foe without a death. Scylla is a strange foe. She isn't a hunter, instead she relies on ambushes. She is fast, but keeps her main body out of the fight. Overall, Scylla isn't a powerhouse. As long as you avoid her, or put yourself where she can't attack you, she's easy to handle. There's only a short period in which she can't attack you. That's why I'm only giving her a 3 of 10 for difficulty. Just prepare ahead and you'll escape. So, you managed to slay Scylla. First thing you need to get is meat. Those tentacles go well with some butter and good breading. You can fry them or stew them. I even found a nice tentacle based sausage. You can get some leather off the dog heads, but the human torso section is very questionable. Yet, yeah, why kill her? The real reward comes from curing the curse. Remember, Scylla was once a nymph. They are a divine race and related to the gods. So, who would want to cure her? Like, say, her mother? What would a water nymph offer you? Fair weather, good currents, what else? A favor from a god? Poseidon, maybe. Who knows what you may get from this one? Finally, if you break the curse, what will Scylla do? Would she join you? Or go seeking her lost lover? This will depend on how things play out. Five more tentacles dove from the cliffside. They drove down as Captain Locke sprang to action. Flames erupted over his hands. They sprouted over the side of the ship into a wall. The heads hissed in response, but they kept their distance until the flames dwindled. The mage wasn't idle in that time. He gave his command to his men, and they reacted. They brought up shields and spears from below deck. Planting them along the walls, they guarded themselves from all sides as the captain jumped behind the wall of wood and steel. The tentacles slammed into the wall. Behind them, the shield men stepped back. Captain Lark rushed to brace his crewmen. Muscles strained against the monster's strength. Peering through an opening, Captain Lark saw the malformed woman glare hungrily at his crew. Growling to himself, Captain Lark could only wait until they were out of her range. The tentacles pulled back and he sighed a breath of relief. His men lowered their shields. That was when Scylla was waiting for. Her tentacles flew out and snatched up five of them at the last second. In fury, he howled and insulted her in vain. They were too far away, and all he could do was watch as Scylla bit into the necks of each of the poor sailors. He pounded his fist onto the wooden railing in anger and cursed the monster. When he came back, he would have his revenge. Scylla may be a legendary monster, but she's hardly a powerhouse. Thanks for watching, adventurers. Please return next week where we should be landing on the back of the giant island turtles. Until then, I'll see you on the road.